Now, for those that uh, were here yesterday, you'll know that my three ministry time slots have been taken up with a consideration of the book of Philippians. And uh, today, what we'd like to do is complete these three messages by looking at the greatest theme, both in terms of the greatest possible theme there could be, but also in terms of its prominence in the four chapters of this book, uh, and that is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the book of Philippians, uh, we spoke yesterday a little bit about a number of the themes, the theme of unity, uh, very hurriedly touched a little bit on the theme of rejoicing and joy that is found through the book. Then yesterday afternoon, we looked at the theme of the mind, a healthy mind for the believer, as taught in these four chapters. And now this afternoon, Lord willing, we'd like to look at the Savior. I'm, uh, I'm not Sandy Higgins. Uh, that's very, very obvious. That's like sort of saying I'm not, I don't know, Santa Claus or I'm not the Pope. It's <laughs> so I can't alliterate. I think Sandy was one of those rare um, prodigies who was born alliterating. He probably, the first few words he said all started with the same letter. But uh, this message this afternoon, actually, and that's not criticism, Sandy, that's admiration. My uncle Jim Allen from Ireland is another one, and David Gilliland. It just, I think it just flows out of them automatically, I'm not sure. And I'm not a big alliterator normally, but this afternoon, just in the organization of my own thoughts, it has fallen a little bit. So if I had to put a title on this, I would say it's Cameos of Christ in Philippians. So again, I've encouraged, especially younger believers, when you study an epistle and you're looking for themes and you're looking, I would encourage you before you even start looking at commentaries, before you dig into a study Bible, read it like a letter. Ignore the chapter divisions, the verse divisions at the beginning and read it like a letter. Read it a number of times because that's how the original recipients received it. And as you read it, look for words and themes and subjects that appear over and over. Look for the development of an argument through it. And if you're doing that with a highlighter, if you look through these four chapters for the references to the Lord Jesus Christ, You'll find, depending on the English version, up to 48 references specifically to his name in the four chapters. So you'll have three times the Lord Jesus Christ, seven times Jesus Christ, nine times Christ Jesus, 18 times the singular title Christ. Once the Lord Jesus, once Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and nine times referred to as the Lord. So if you do that with a highlighter, you can go back in your own time and you can certainly build much more onto the revelation of Christ that we're given in this epistle. But what I would like to do for sake of time this afternoon is just pick out five cameos or five little portraits that give us a glimpse into the person who formed the very reason for living for the man who wrote this letter, the Apostle Paul. So we'll start in chapter 1. And verse 21, chapter 1 and verse 21, one of the challenges I had at the beginning yesterday was, can you quote one verse from each of the four chapters? Well, here's a great one, a uh, candidate from chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 21, just for uh, context, we'll go back to verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, Paul writes, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also... Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I've called this little portrait or this cameo the solitary Christ. The solitary Christ. Now you may say, well, what does that have to do with what Paul says? Well, basically this. I mentioned briefly yesterday, this is one of the most searching statements made in the epistle for me as an individual. Because the Apostle Paul, not boastfully, but transparently from his heart, in pretty bad circumstances, he essentially says to these Philippian believers, I am rejoicing because the Christ is being preached. And the worst thing that could happen, if we read a couple of verses down, is the worst thing that could happen is I would depart to be with Christ. And that's far better. And he more or less says, if you look at my life and look into my heart, 
And I think it was Mr. Crawford maybe called this an open window on a devoted heart. It's the most personal of Paul's letters written to an assembly. And he opens up his heart and he lets them see inside and he said, for me, for to me, to live is Christ. Could I ask you, honestly, what do you live for? How do you measure that? When you get up in the morning, what's the first thing that goes through your mind? When you get out of bed and shower, and I hope you shower, when you get out of bed and shower and brush your teeth and face the day, what is it that, that excites you? What is it that interests you? Now, a certain amount of it, I think, in our, certainly in our culture, in Western life, it's, it's the obligations, it's the responsibilities, it's the job, it's for mothers, it's the children that you have to look after. It's, it's all of the things that demand our time. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the things that you actually go after in life, the things that your mind turns to. There are likely many of them. I spoke a few couple of years back now at Tampa with Peter Ramsey, and I was given this passage to speak on. And I talked about foundations for life. And I think if you're honest, if I'm honest and I start looking at why I live and what I live for and what matters to me and what is it that makes me who I am, forms my identity, makes me who I am. There's a whole lot of things that are faulty as a foundation for life. And yet they're very, very prevalent, even among us as Christians. Possessions? Absolutely. In our society, wealth, possessions, success. It's the big reason why most people live. The man who wrote this didn't matter to him. We'll find that in chapter 3. It didn't make any difference to him. Popularity? Again, very, very common. We're not immune from that as Christians. We love feedback, positive feedback. We want to feel significant. We measure our sense of significance by the reactions that we receive from other people. And as I mentioned yesterday, social media has not made, invented that issue, but it has certainly exacerbated it. And so people constantly crave some sense of acceptance and admiration and popularity. Then there's things that are not in themselves necessarily faulty but they're flimsy. And if we're honest, they form a very large part of the foundation of our lives. Things like productivity, right? Man was made to work. I mean, mankind. We, we were built to be productive right from the very blueprint that came from God. But it was never meant to be the reason for which we live. And yet often it is. I remember uh, when we had a business for 20 years, sold it in 2007. The first business we owned, we own a different one now. If anybody had asked me before I sold that business in my mid-40s, you know, what do you live for? Is your business? I would have said, no, business is just a way to pay the bills. It's just, it's just a means to an end. It's just what I do to support my family and, you know, whatever service the Lord has for me. Work and business is just a means to that end. And I meant it. I actually thought it was true until I'd sold the business. And I remember about six months or so after the business sold, sitting one morning in my study with my third coffee of the morning, it was like 10 o'clock, and feeling totally useless. I had come out of an environment as the owner of a business where everybody wanted my input. Everybody was seeking my approval. Everybody was wanting me to give them direction. Everybody wanted me to approve what they were doing. And I was responding to that constantly. And I found myself now in an environment where it seemed there wasn't one creature in God's green earth that cared what I thought. And I was sitting there thinking I got so much to offer and nobody wants any of it. Who am I and what am I doing here? I didn't have a total breakdown midlife crisis. Maybe I should have, but I didn't. But I'll tell you this, I certainly honestly understood that that business meant a whole lot more to me than I thought it did. Relationships, family. The world will tell you that's the greatest responsibility you have. And I would echo at least this to Christian parents here and grandparents of whom I'm now one. It is a tremendous responsibility, but it doesn't take the place of Christ. You want an Old Testament example of that? Abraham had a God-promised, God-given son in Isaac. And yet God put his finger on the thing closest to Abraham's heart and said, Abraham, do you live for Isaac or do you live for me? Take your son and offer him up. Here in chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, for to me to live is Christ. You know the real benefit of a christ Founded life is nothing can shake it. 
Nothing can shake it. Live long enough, and every other reason for living will eventually be frittered away. It will. Relationships will change. I'm not saying they'll change in bitterness. They'll just change. They'll evolve. Rachel and I have four children. The last one just got married a few months ago. They don't need us the same way they did. They still need us, I think, in some degree, especially if it's to pay for something. But life changes. Family life evolves. Live long enough. There's many of you here can attest to this. There's a strong likelihood you will lose your life partner. Marriage is for life, but it's only for life. As long as you both shall live. Then what? Then who are you? But live with the foundation on Christ. And everything else will fall into its proper place. Abraham kept his son. God didn't want Abraham's son. God wanted Abraham. God wants you. God wants me. And a life that is founded on Christ is a life that will never, ever lose a reason for its confidence. There's a dear sister in Trinidad, and I'm going to have to move on here, but there's a dear sister in Trinidad that I know very, very well. She was one of the first people saved in the center of the island when my parents went there. Her name is Sister Kwamina. And Sister Kwamina had, I believe, eight children. She's buried four of them. The last that she buried was her oldest son, who had looked after her. Her husband was uh, not very uh, good at providing, and George had been the, the rock in that family. He was an overseer in the assembly at Orangefield, and that dear lady had lost a 12-year-old son quite a few years earlier, stepped on a rusty nail, got tetanus, and died. She had lost another son in a car crash. She had lost a daughter to breast cancer, and now she lost her firstborn son, who was really the provider for them all. And I was down there at that time for the funeral, and I was sitting up in her high house on the front porch, maybe a week or so after the funeral, and the dear lady was crying. And I mean, what do you say? What can I say? I, I can't understand what she's going through. But that sister, through her tears, she looked at me and she said this. She said, Andrew, my friends in this village, they tell me, it was like a modern day version of Job's story. My friends in this village tell me, how can you still trust a God that allows that to happen? But she said, you know, if I turned away from the Lord, then I really would have nothing. And the only thing I know I'll never lose is him. That's what Paul says. Paul says, for to me, to live is Christ. And all I can tell you is from the honesty of my own soul, I just pray that that was more true for me. I don't know what life will hold. I love my wife. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. I do enjoy my business. I enjoy my assembly. There are many things in terms of activities that provide a certain amount of feedback that if I'm honest, they are a big part of who I am and what I do. But the Lord knows, I hope, I pray, that at the core, at the foundation underneath it all, that the reason I am who I am is found in the person of God's eternal Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The solitary Christ in chapter 1. Chapter 2, verse 5, the second cameo we have, Paul says, let this mind be in you, dealing with the need for humility and unity. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here we have the selfless Christ. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, although it certainly merits careful attention. We touched on some of these themes yesterday. And on Friday night when we began with 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, the one that was rich, who for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. This is a parallel concept here. The one who, as Brother Joseph reminded us this morning, could not possibly have been higher. Sometimes you'll hear from the platform people say that made himself of no reputation it means that uh, equality with God, sorry, not that, uh, he was in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. They'll say it means it wasn't something he grasped after, and that is literally what it means. 
to understand that it's essentially what Brother Joseph was saying. If you look at Lucifer, who was the highest of the created beings, his great downfall was to grasp after something that was not intrinsically his, to reach up and to grasp for it. I will be as the Most High. Concerning the Lord Jesus, he didn't grasp after that because it was his. But it doesn't just mean that he didn't grasp after it. It means that he didn't cling to it. It was legitimately his. He could not stop being equal with God. He is God. But the one who was the highest and is God, in this passage, he was willing to empty himself into the form of a servant, be made in the likeness of men, and as a man, humble himself and become obedient. You know, in your case and my case, obedience is contrasted with disobedience. So our life is a process of becoming obedient or trying to become obedient. If we raise children, hopefully as parents, we recognize that one of our roles is to teach them to be obedient because their little sinful natures are going to naturally cause them to be disobedient. So in us, obedience contrasts with disobedience. Obedience in him, he didn't have to learn obedience in the language of Hebrews or become obedient in the language of Philippians 2 because in any way, it was in contrast to disobedience. He was incapable of disobedience because in him there is no sin. In him, obedience contrasts with supremacy. It's submission, willing, voluntary submission of one who by right is supreme. But one who was the highest of the high became low and came into this world so that others could benefit. That is the selfless Christ. I want you to notice the verbs. You'll notice in the first section describing the downstooping of the Lord Jesus, there's two active verbs that he did himself. The King James, it says he made himself of no reputation or he emptied himself. He took that initiative and that action willingly himself. And then being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. He wasn't humiliated, he humbled himself himself. But notice in the second section, that as it comes to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is passive. It says, wherefore, God has highly exalted him. God has given him a name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and earth and under the earth. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is the supreme example of the principle, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Now, again, we, we need to do that because it's really the only appropriate place we should be is to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And He will exalt you in due time. He humbled Himself by choice. He gave of Himself willingly, but God, in appreciation of that, that down stooping that went all the way to death, even the death of the cross, God, in appreciation of that, God has stepped in and God has raised him and God has given him a name and God is going to ensure that every tongue will confess. And I've really often enjoyed that it's to the glory of God the Father. Sometimes people will say, well, why does the kingdom really matter? And, you know, once the rapture comes and we're in heaven, do I really need to understand anything further about eschatology, anything further about the Bible? Well, I'll tell you this, it really, really matters to his father. I want to say it reverently, his father is not going to rest until his son is acknowledged for who he really is. Heaven was silent at Calvary. There was no intervening voice that corrected the assessment of the crowd. I love the language of Hebrews chapter 1. He says to the son, sit on my right hand until, until I make your enemies your footstool. And God is going to see to it that every tongue will confess that the selfless one who died in apparent shame on a cross is the Lord of all. That's the selfless Christ. When you come to chapter 3, we'll read from uh, verse 8 of chapter 3. And in verse 8 of chapter 3, Paul's describing here his life, what things were gained to me, verse 7, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Let me just read you that verse 8 from the English Standard Version. Paul says in verse 8, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might win Christ. A little title for this would be the surpassing Christ. I want to move quickly, so I don't want to miss my last point, but never get into your mind, dear believer today, never get into your mind that sacrifice for Christ leaves me empty. I've given up so much for the Lord that I'm sitting here now with nothing. Nothing is further from the truth. That's exactly what Paul's saying in chapter 3. Paul says in chapter 3, I had a life that was the envy of my peers. I had all of the hallmarks of success as a young Jewish man. And all of those things at one point in my life, they were gained to me. They were badges of honor. They were marks of acceptance. They were, they were hallmarks of success in my society. But there came a point where all of the things that were gained for me, I counted them loss. I reckoned them as nothing for Christ. And I still feel the same way. I count them all as rubbish. So, Paul, does that mean that you're just sitting now sort of like bereft of everything and empty? Like, you know, you're like a monk sitting up on a mountain and you've given up everything in life and you're just kind of sitting here now waiting for heaven? That's the furthest thing from Paul's mind in chapter 3. Paul says, yes, I gave all of that up. Why did I do it? I did it for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. Paul says, I wasn't left empty, I was filled. I didn't give everything up and have nothing. I gave everything up and I have everything. In fact, he would say, I gave nothing up. I reckon it as nothing. It's, it's just, just nothing. It's absolutely not worthy to be compared with the surpassing excellence, the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. I would encourage you, and I've taken this to my own heart, to cultivate a tremendous appetite to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You will know Him from His Word. Look for Him in the Scripture. When you study a passage of Scripture, ask yourself some questions about what does this teach me of the Lord Jesus? If it's specifically referring to Him, it's fairly easy. But even if it isn't, for example, the last time I read through the book of Psalms, I, as I read through it, one of the things that I enjoyed doing was thinking, what did reading this psalm mean to the perfect man who lived on earth and meditated in the law of the Lord day and night? As he read the psalms, as he grew up living here and he increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, as he fed his soul on the living word of God, what did this psalm mean to him? Look for Christ. And fill your mind and your appreciation of the knowledge of Him. It's not just academic. It includes studying. I would, I would encourage that. It's not purely subjective. It's not that I just, it's how I feel about my walk and how, how close I feel to Him. No. It's certainly learning more about Him. But it's more than learning more about Him. It's learning Him more. Begin with a study of who He is. Increase in your knowledge of Him. And then as you pray... Ask for an increased experience of the knowledge of Christ. If Philippians chapter 3 teaches me anything, it teaches me this, that that surpasses anything else in human experience. The Lord Jesus himself in John chapter 17 describes eternal life like this. Living forever? No, that's sort of a given. How does he describe eternal life? Speaking to his Father, he says, it's that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So chapter 3, you have the surpassing Christ. Over to chapter 4, down in verse 13. In chapter 4, Paul's describing his experience. Uh, he'd received a gift from the assembly at Philippi. He's thanking them for it. But as he thanks them for it, he says in verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want. In other words, he's saying, I don't want you to feel sorry for me as though like I'm begging for support. He says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I am instructed. 
both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is the sufficient Christ. You'll see this alliteration is pretty obvious. It's kind of right there on the surface. That's why I can do it. I didn't have to dig hard with a a thesaurus. Can't say that. It's right there, the sufficient Christ. Paul says, whatever circumstance I'm in, I've learned to be content. This is an equally challenging statement. You find yourself in some unpleasant circumstance. And in the presence of God, say, can I say that? You know, sometimes we only link contentment to material things. Like, in other words, you know, I'm not covetous of some new car or some whatever, like some possession. And I am content to do without some material possession. But I think it's actually much more challenging when you see what Paul's speaking of here. It's not just the presence or the absence of material goods. What about circumstantial contentment? I am content whatever state I'm in. I'll accept it from the Lord. That's what Paul says. That's almost as searching as for to me to live as Christ. Because I can't honestly say that. I pray that I could say it more truthfully. Because there's been a few states that I've been in, a few circumstances that come along where the Lord knows my heart and I've gone to Him and I'm not really terribly content. And I'll be honest, for me, this has been a painful lesson to learn. But I have learned it, I would say, retrospectively. I'm not very good at it yet presently. Like when I'm in the middle of a circumstance, I'm not very good at remembering this and living the good of it. But as I look back, as the years of my life unfold, I can see that through the various seasons of life, through the various circumstances, there's one thing that has always been constant. The Lord has always brought me through. He's always been sufficient. I may not have liked it at the time, but I can look back and I can see that the Lord was sufficient to bring me through. And Paul is saying here that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's basically saying that there will not be a circumstance in life, and there never has been. As I am pursuing the will of God for my life, and He is pursuing His purposes through me, I will never end up in a situation but that Christ will be sufficient to meet my need. Now that doesn't mean, it's not an empty promise that I can claim. You know, I, I can't say, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, so I can throw a javelin like Caleb Zudeman or Seth Zudeman. No, I can't. I never will. It's not like some flippant thing that I can just claim and say, oh, I can do. No, I, I, what it means is I can do whatever God intends me to do. I can be whatever God intends me to be. I can fulfill whatever God intends to fulfill through me, through Christ who pours His strength into me. He will always prove sufficient. So dear brother or sister, if you are in a tough situation in life and you're wondering how can I go on, could I just sound a note of encouragement to your heart? Christ is sufficient. It may not feel like it. It may not seem like it. But He will not leave you. He will not abandon you. He will further His work through you. And He will bring you through. That's the message of Philippians chapter 4. But finally, because my time's just about gone, just turn back to chapter 3. The fifth and final cameo I want to leave us with is in chapter 3 and verse 20. Chapter 3, verse 20, our citizenship, our conversation is in heaven From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body or these bodies of our humiliation, that they may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. The final cameo of Christ that we have is one that is still future. Paul says, here we are on earth. Philippians, you're all proud of being citizens of Rome. I'm a citizen of Canada. I'm very grateful for it. I was an immigrant. I was taken into a country that was not where I was born. And that country has embraced me and given me an opportunity to be married and raise a family and serve the Lord. I'm thankful to be a citizen of Canada. You are mostly, I'm sure, citizens of America. And I don't think I have to tell Americans to be proud to be Americans. It's sort of woven into your DNA. There's a lot of people in the world that would long, would long for citizenship 
in a place that is stable and free and provides hope and opportunity. We should be grateful for our earthly citizenship. But you know, whatever our earthly citizenship is, the big thing really is that our citizenship is in heaven. And it has been given to us freely, but it has been purchased for us by the blood of God's Son. And we live now on earth temporarily as pilgrims, but our true sense of belonging, our true sense of where I want to be, that the true sense of my homing instinct is to heaven. But I love what Paul says here. He doesn't say our citizenship is in heaven and it's a place with streets of gold or our citizenship is in heaven and many of our loved ones are already there, although those things are all valid. What Paul says is our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await or we look for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Christ our Savior, if you want the final S. You know, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says, the Lord himself shall come. John chapter 14, the Lord speaking personally said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. In 1 Peter chapter 5, we read the chief shepherd shall appear. But here in Philippians chapter 3, it doesn't say the Lord, it doesn't say the chief shepherd, it says the Savior. And this makes it very, very personal to me. Sometimes with gospel preaching, we get the idea maybe that salvation is something that took place at a moment in time, and it did. And I'm not at all suggesting that we change gospel preaching to throw that away because salvation does take place in a moment of time. But you know, on October the 15th, 1974, a little boy, me, 10 years old, I trusted the Lord Jesus, and in that moment, I was given eternal life. I was just as saved as I'll ever be in terms of God's purposes. But you know, my salvation, me personally, and you too, brother or sister, my salvation involves an awful lot more than what happened that night, October the 15th. I am saved because of something that happened long before I was born. When a man took my place, and in a way that I'll never truly fully understand, he bore my sin, not just the penalty for it, my sin itself, all of it, its curse, its guilt, its distance, its defilement, my sin, he bore it. As Peter says, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. My salvation involves something that happened there, something that he did and he finished at the cross. You know, my salvation also involves something he continues to do. The writer of the Hebrews says that he is able to save to the uttermost all that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. And to me, it's so touching to think that the man who hung on the cross for me is a man who now lives and intercedes for me constantly at the Father's right hand. My life as a believer, 47 years of meandering and wandering, and God knows, uphill, downhill, close and far, through it all, there's a Savior who intercedes for me. I'll never lose my salvation. But it's not just that He finished a work, it's that He's continuing a work.